Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's podcast is looking at direct-to-print aligners, this relatively new material and how it can be used both in its fabrication but also in clinical use when it comes to treating patients. This was a lecture given by the innovative Simon Graf, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing two years ago as part of the Orthodontics in Interview podcast. To summarise, this podcast is an opinion piece by myself and the Orthodontics in Summary team. We try our best to ensure it's accurate, but may not be 100% representative of the original lecture. We try our best to ensure that it is. Now getting back to the lecture. When it comes to looking at direct-to-print aligners, Simon focused on comparing it to conventional aligners, both in its material properties and in the second half looked at really what are the clinical applications of direct-to-print aligners. So what are the manufacturing differences between these two? Well, conventional aligners are typically produced by printing the resin model of the teeth. Then a thermoforming process takes place using plastic and that creates the aligner. Direct-to-print aligners are fundamentally different. It's the aligner itself which is printed. There is no resin model which is used and then therefore the manufacturing processes are reduced. Even the post-processing of an aligner has reduced stages compared to conventional aligners. It's quicker to produce as a consequence. But that is just manufacturing. What are the material differences between the two? Well, starting off with just the thickness of the aligner. With conventional aligners, you are restricted to the minimum size of 0.7 millimeters. However, when it comes to direct-to-print aligners, it is as low as 0.5 millimeters. And having this flexibility in choosing the thickness of not only the entirety of the liner, but also individual aspects of the liner allows to manipulate the forces associated with it. What about looking at aligners from an environmental perspective? There was a great paper last month by Slaymaker in 2024. And what he looked at was the resin waste produced from aligners. Now they showed that in 2022, there were 122 million resin models produced and disposed of. That is something that would not take place with direct to print aligners. What about looking at simply the accuracy of the liner that gets produced? Well, when three materials were compared, that's the Endura, Essex Ace, and direct to print aligner materials, it was found that the direct to print material was 20 to 30% more accurate when it came to the fit. That's Kyung's study from 2022. Interestingly enough in the study, it still showed that with all materials, there still seems to be a degree of error that takes place. Now, what about when it comes to the forced delivery of the different aligners? Well, Herton's study from 2022 showed direct-to-print aligners deliver 50% less force. 2.5 newtons versus 5 newtons for conventional aligners. What's more interesting though, I find, is that when we increase the strain, the activation associated with the aligner, the force only increases by a small increment, not to the degree that conventional aligners are, which seem to be significantly stiffer than direct-to-print aligners. My interpretation of this, the current staging that we have for aligners is limited to due to the material properties. However, we may be able to get far greater activation using a material such as direct-to-print aligners. What about other properties? Well, shape memory effect has been put forward. So just to explain what that is for direct print aligners, the material essentially has these polymer chains which are cross-linked. What does that mean? Well, when the force is removed from the aligner itself, it restores itself back to its original properties. And that's very different compared to conventional aligner materials, which seem to distort, they have creep and warping effects that take place. So the direct print aligner can recover its full shape and properties and that can be accelerated by simply placing them in water. This was Lee's study from 2022. So it all sounds favorable for direct print aligners, but Simon Graf did mention there's a lack of evidence when it comes to this material. We may have described the shape memory effect, but how effective it is in clinical practice still remains unclear. Cytotoxicity, one of those basic requirements when it comes to having a material inside the mouth, there is some evidence, but it's very limited and not long-term stuff. So we need to understand that this material still needs further testing. And when it comes to changing the thickness, although they may offer some biomechanical advantages in the process, however, it's unclear how much force differs 
when we start changing it on an individual level. So there's still points we've got to explore. Now, the second aspect was a clinical application of the properties of direct print aligners. The first thing Simon started off with is the lateral incisors and aligners, the most difficult tooth to conventionally move, and how can that be addressed by direct print aligners? What he described was using a thickened amount of aligner material around the cervical or gingival aspect, a gingival pressure or wedge as he described it. This squeezes the lateral incisor and therefore delivers the extrusive forces more predictably. The second thing he described was the use of aligner hooks. With conventional aligners, there's always a break in the aligner, whether it's for buttons or for a hook to be cut out. With direct-to-print aligners, additional material can be added to the aligner, and that has the significant advantage of maintaining full control of the tooth where the aligner is going to be added, where the elastic is going to be added. Now, he also gave this clinical pearl. Whichever material one is using, we should still use attachments on the tooth which has the elastic attached to it to achieve control of that tooth. When it comes to looking at mandibular advancements, there's been a whole host of them within a lot of conventional aligners, but they have some problems in Simon's opinion. One of those is that wings can sometimes be too soft and therefore don't maintain the anterior posterior position for mandibular advancement. Likewise, a very hard block is more prone to breakages. Now, the advantage of direct print aligners is we can choose both the thickness and therefore the size of the blocks to get the ideal material and size. When it comes to bite ramps, conventional appliances of aligners struggle with the size of them. After a certain level, they cannot be any longer. They'll make the properties unstable off the actual aligner. Now, direct print aligners have no restriction. They can cover aspects of the palate and therefore it allows any size and dimension of a bite plane to be created within the aligner itself. Once more, it can be separated from the dentition, so you can still have full coverage of the tooth and also have a bite plane, which I thought was really innovative as an idea. Transverse expansion. Simon showed an excellent image of where a direct print aligner has plastic going across the roof of the palate, almost simulating a transpalatal arch. This allows reciprocal anchorage to be used to achieve expansion using the aligner, which conventional aligners can't do at this stage. Simon was quick to say, this is still being researched. We're not sure how much force it delivers. And I think that's insightful for anybody who's exploring a new topic. What I loved about Simon's lecture was his conclusion, how one should enjoy the variability of direct print aligners. And for me, it summates his innovation within orthodontics, but also in this new topic of direct print aligners, where really it's the creativity and acumen of the clinician which is driving this process of innovation. That's it for me. Please do subscribe as always and look forward to the next episode.